This is Greg Gallant from MuckRack. Welcome to our MuckRack webinar. I'm so happy everyone was able to join. This has uh, gotten an unbelievable response, and we're looking uh, forward to diving in today. I'm, uh, again, Greg Gallant. I started MuckRack uh, several years ago. I also created the Shorty Awards, which are the awards for best of social media. And soon after that, we launched MuckRack in 2009. It's been growing ever since, and uh, excited to have our wonderful guest today from the Wall Street Journal to dive into a very timely topic. We have Todd Olmsted, the senior audience engagement expert, and Natalie Andrews, the social media editor at the Wall Street Journal. Before I let them introduce themselves, I want to uh, require everybody on this call to follow them on Twitter, because they always share great stuff at Todd J. Olmstead and at Natalie WSJ. Once we're done confirming that everyone on the line has followed them, we'll uh, proceed with the webinar. All right, I think we have confirmation, guys. So Todd, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? Thanks, I got at least one Twitter notification just now, so I'm, I'm very pleased. Um, Thanks, Greg. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. My name is Todd Olmsted. I am a senior audience engagement editor at the Wall Street Journal here in New York. Uh, I have been here for almost three years. Um, my role focuses on um, uh, audience engagement, and that includes uh, overseeing social globally for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it also includes comments on WSJ.com and um, also kind of the various ways we um, have a conversation with our readers, the way that we bring our audience perspective into our storytelling, um, the way we uh, distribute our content to reach different people in different ways, kind of all of that stuff falls under the umbrella of audience engagement. Um, before I was here, I was at Mashable for three years as a community manager. And um, before that, I was at NYU getting a master's degree in the Studio 20 program, which focuses on um, digital journalism and uh, innovation in news. Natalie, you want to go ahead? Hi, all. Um, I'm Natalie Andrews, and I am the social media editor that is based in DC. And I work primarily with our politics team and policy teams to help make that content social, distribute that content on our social channels here that are politics focused, and also train our team here on best social media practices and different things of that nature. So right now we are all focused on the final seven days of the presidential elections and the Senate contests, gubernatorial contests that we have going on. Um, it's been quite a ride in the past year and a half, as I'm sure you are all feeling. I think all of America and the world is counting down for the last seven days. Um, and we've been covering, I mean, it's, it's weird to think that we're here um, because we've been here, for, I mean, the primaries, the debates, all of it. So I've been at the Wall Street Journal for two years and been in D.C. that whole time. Um, before that, I was at the NBC affiliate in Salt Lake City that had kind of a broader social media and marketing role there. And uh, before that, I was finishing up my MBA at the University of San Diego. So I've always had kind of a news social marketing background, but news people are my people, and I love being here. I'm looking forward to talking about politics today. Great, and we, we distributed your Twitter handles, but is there anywhere else people should follow you guys? Snapchat, Facebook, et cetera? Uh, I'm the uh, same handle pretty much everywhere, Todd J. Olmstead. Um, so I guess you can find me on um, Instagram or Facebook or even Snapchat when, I, um, when I'm on there. Uh, if you find that to be interesting, feel free to say hi there, and uh, we'll connect. Um, my Instagram is pretty much just pictures of my really cute pug. 
so I'm not entirely sure you'd want to follow me there. Um, I can endorse that, though. Your dog, who I've never met in real life, is probably my favorite thing about Instagram. She's very adorable. So <laughs> Instagram is kind of my place where I do not talk about politics. Although I did, you know, do the – I posted about voting on, you know, a nonpartisan voting image on uh, – this is Sunday, so we are counting down. The all life has just become all encompassing with this campaign. So great. Well, we look forward to hearing more about uh, dogs in the presidential campaign. But first, I just got to do a <laughs> bit of housekeeping and just give everyone a bit of context about Muckrack and why we're all here, and then we'll let Todd and Natalie take it away. So first of all, we'll be collecting questions throughout this webinar. You simply tweet your questions with hashtag muckracking. You can feel free to at mention Todd and Natalie or myself. I'm just at Gregory on Twitter. I signed up early, so I was able to uh, nab that without any special favors. But simply hashtag muckracking. And we'll be collecting your questions and then asking them of Todd and Natalie, along with a shout out for whoever asked the question at the uh, end of their presentation. So first, I just want to tell everyone a bit about Muckrack. This is just a small sampling of the companies that use Muckrack. Uh, we have hundreds and now thousands of companies that use Muckrack, as well as thousands of journalists that use our tools for journalists. Uh, companies, PR departments, PR agencies use Muckrack to find journalists to tell their stories, organize the press campaign, monitor, pitch, and measure. And then journalists use Muckrack uh, to build free public portfolios to show off their work, uh, use our tracking tools to see how much impact their stories have had, connect with their colleagues, and also find trending news stories. This is just a quick view of our search. The really cool thing about Muckrack is you can search and just type in any keyword in the world, your company name, a person's name, a very particular you know, product field, anything else like that. And then it will figure out which journalists write or tweet the most about that keyword. So here's an example where you could type in MasterCard, see the journalist that writes most articles about MasterCard, and also instances when they've tweeted about that key term. And then it makes it very easy to organize those journalists into media lists from which you can uh, kind of start outreach or other kind of using in other ways to figure out which journalists you should be communicating with about a story. We also have alerts, so it'll email you the moment any journalist tweets or writes a story about any particular keyword, uh, often uh, just very quickly after it's happened, usually before a Google alert comes. So it's a great way to kind of get that insight into what's being said about your brand, or company, or keyword right now. There's also a great way to see which journalists are, uh, when journalists create these free portfolios, journalists use it often to show their work to other journalists, but it also gives you contact information so you can reach out to the journalists or follow them on social media. In addition, we index simply every journalist out there and everything that anyone writes. You can just find any journalist out there in the world. And we also give similar profile and statistics for any publication to see their unique visitors per month, their audience, their social profiles, uh, contact information, et cetera. And finally, we have tools uh, to track the impact of stories. This is very popular both for companies that want to track all their coverage and also journalists that want to see how much social engagement the stories they've wrote have had where it'll automatically find any article about a company or keyword, add it to a coverage report, and then for every article you could see how many times it was shared on social media, the unique visitors per month of that publication, uh, who wrote the stories, lots of other great metadata. And you can dig into it further using our tool, Who Shared My Link. This can also be found through whosharedmylink.com. And part of this tool is available to anybody for free. We can just pop in any URL, and it tells you how many times that URL was shared on social media, the unique visitors of the publication, 
and uh, very cool which journals have shared it. So you can see a story written in the Wall Street Journal might have been shared by 20 journalists at other publication and it breaks that down for you in terms of the kind of true reach that, that article's had. So if you want to learn anything more about Muckrack, uh, you can just go to muckrack.com and request a demo or in the process of signing up for this, you had an opportunity uh, to request a demo too and you can always delve in and uh, try out how it works for you. With that though, we'd love to get into the meat of this webinar and hear more from Todd and Natalie about what the Wall Street Journal is up to. Before I let them take it away, I just want to remind everybody, tweet your questions, hashtag muckracking, and we'll collect those and ask them at the end. So with that, Todd and Natalie, take it away. Great. Thanks, Greg. Um, so yeah, I'm Todd and uh, we have Natalie too. Uh, today we're going to talk about um, a few different things uh, related to election coverage and social. Uh, uh, creating content specifically for social and how we distribute to social. Uh, we're going to talk about how we use social to um, uh, find sources and develop our reporting. And then we'll talk a little bit about how we develop content um, with an eye for social media uh, content that we know is going to have kind of a, a long tail and um, do, do well on social. So um, Natalie, do you want to kick us off by talking about uh, the importance of teamwork to our operation here? For sure. So we, I would say anyone who's worked in a newsroom or in communications, I think the joke is often that communications people don't always communicate the best internally. And one thing we've worked hard on is communicating internally. Um, in a breaking news environment especially, and this election has been one of those, we have had reporters say, like, hey, I want to know when these stories are publishing. I want to know what's going on. I want to know what the Clinton team is doing because I'm on the Trump team, and I want to know as much as I can to keep in touch with these people and follow this, especially during the primary season where it's hard enough to keep in touch, keep up with, you know, all the Republicans over here. I, you know, we wanted to make it easy for us to communicate. And so, and people wanted to tweet each other stories, which is music to me as a social media editor's ears. Like, what can I do to make it easier? So one of the simplest things we came up with was when stories published, we just started sending them out. People, I was worried at first about, you know, I'm going to be flooding these people's inboxes. And people were like, no, this is the kind of email I want to get. And it's still a work in progress, but we, this is a sample email of something that people get from me quite often and from other editors. Uh, we send, you know, hey, this story just pubbed, tweet it if you can. Um, here's some sample tweets. And then we also send this email up to New York to Todd's team who can then schedule it on some wider accounts. And then they also know what is going on, which might be helpful for them to know what is going on as Todd might be able to <laughs> say. Yeah, it's really helpful for us to hear from the people who are doing the reporting and doing the editing because they're uh, so much closer to these stories and these topics and um, for them to be able to really help us wrap our heads around um, what, the, what the key stories are, what the key points in stories are, and um, you know, how, we can, uh, how we can help distribute them is um, is so helpful for us because we're managing an influx of stories from all around the world, all kinds of different topics, um, and they just kind of like help us filter through what they're working on, uh, and it's it's really useful. And reporters writing their own tweets, they know what they want pulled from the story. They know it can go viral. They know what is the little gems that and the little facts that they want to tweet, and so sharing that right from the get-go I think helps a lot. The other thing that we've been working on too is involving social people early and often and seeking to prob solve the problem of, oh, we should tell the social people that this big exclusive just published so they can promote it um, after the fact, which 
um, is something that I don't know if anybody else out there has ever dealt with, but you know, it's something that you know, if there's not a lot of communication going on and a reporter works on a story and gets an exclusive and goes down that train and then the story gets published, there's just not a lot of communication and to say like, oh hey, we got to like plan a promotion strategy around this. And so we've really been working to like involve more people in the process. And that is something that goes against like journalism, the mindset of like, oh, we, we keep this story like close tight. We keep that story like close. We don't let it out. We don't talk about it. And so that is, we've been trying to expand that out so that we can try to make stories um, so we're ready to promote stories right from the get-go. And that might involve something simple, just as having tweets ready, or it might be something like having graphics and GIFs and stuff ready to go, and meeting with a graphics team to design a story that will do better on social and stuff like that way ahead of before a story publishes. Yeah, and uh, one thing that we do um, a lot is you know, we we try to have roles defined when we're doing something like um, live coverage from a debate or a primary or something like that. And this kind of communication has really helped us um, on something like a, a convention night or a debate night. Um, we know who's doing what um, between uh, Natalie and uh, myself and other folks on the team either in D.C. or in New York or, or potentially even on the ground at one of these events, we set up, uh, we, we slack a lot to kind of um, maintain a line of communication going throughout the night. And that helps us like uh, kind of stay organized and stay on track. And, and then to use an example from a convention, if Natalie says, uh, Natalie's running the WSJ Politics Twitter account and she's going to go down to the convention floor to shoot some Periscope video, she can tell us in real time, okay guys, I'm going to go do this, and then we can adjust and we can say, okay, someone is going to pick up the WSJ Politics Twitter while Natalie goes and spends 20 minutes on the floor getting video, and that just like really helps us stay all on the same page. Yeah, Slack is a really awesome thing. Other phone calls, Todd is, was really great during the conventions to be like, Natalie, get on the phone, we're going to communicate. <laughs> I'd be like, I am so busy. <laughs> but. Well, I can solve a lot of the problems, but um, <laughs> phone and talk. Um, so the conventions is a good segue for the next part. Um, throughout the election cycle, and um, I think especially in 2016, we've really looked at how we can take um, both WSJ reporting uh, that's, that's going to live on WSJ.com in some form, and uh, have it live on different platforms um, like Snapchat, like Instagram, uh, but also how can we create um, specific content for those platforms or, or specific experiences that live on those platforms. Um, and Snapchat is a really good place to start with um, uh, the conventions, and Nat Natalie can tell you what she's done using Snapchat, kind of reporting from the field throughout the election cycle. Yeah, Snapchat has been a lot of fun. I think this whole election it's been, there's so much to experiment with, which has been a lot of fun. And we Snapchatted, I think one of my first Snapchat experiences was a year ago when we sponsored, a, well, WSJ was one of the partners with the debate uh, with Fox Business. And so we took WSJ Snapchat followers behind the scenes there, and it was the first debate I'd ever attended. So I think I was also showing people like my eyes, and I was just kind of wandering around. I'm like, hey, let's go on the stage. No one's told me no yet. And so I took people on the stage, and we went, I mean, it was way before the debate started, like 24 hours. And so, you know, and we went, you know, hey, here's where the dressing rooms are going to be tomorrow, and hey, here's where things, you know, and we just, I explored you know, and showed people on Snapchat as I was walking around behind the scenes because I thought it was cool. And it was really cool for me to see people geek out with me. And people got really excited, you know, and I was thinking it was cool to see the signs go up. And I'd never been to Wisconsin before, so we were eating cheese and I was like, here's some beer. People thought that was cool. And the people during the conventions too were asking really interesting questions. And 
that was different moments throughout this past year when we did Snapchat. I kept thinking, this is a really interesting way where we're connecting with people and connecting with our followers where they're asking questions, they're expecting an answer. And you know, we're having this I'm having all these side conversations with people about, you know, hey, why are they booing Ted Cruz or why are these people angry during the RNC or during the DNC, hey, why are they wearing these, you know, I was pointing out the bright shirts that Bernie Sanders supporters had suddenly started wearing and people were asking more details and and stuff and so I was trying to talk to them and explain what was going on and so it was interesting and these are people that might not pick up a Wall Street Journal every day, I don't know, but you know, just judging on their profiles or things like that, they seemed younger, not our typical audience and I hope that maybe we our brand connected with some people that maybe will say, hey, like the Wall Street Journal made an impression. And maybe they do read the Wall Street Journal every day. I don't know. But it was fun to connect with them um, through Snapchat, which is something that I had only experimented with briefly before the debate last year. And then throughout the campaign, now we've told all sorts of stories on a political way there, which has been a lot of fun. And it's the questions you get back you realize how much people are paying attention. The other thing we've done is Facebook Live. Todd, we push it forward, thanks. Um, and Facebook Live is the other, so we were the second newspaper to go live on Facebook, and that was a year ago. Um, I asked Facebook if we could be one of their experimenters, and they said yes, and so we tried it out. And now I think about that and how we go live at least once a day, and it shows you how much a social platform can change in a year. And it makes me wonder what we're going to be doing next year. Or what are we going to be doing in 2020 for that presidential campaign that has already started <laughs> with people. There's presidential candidates already in Iowa. So I don't, you know, it's, it's very interesting to think like what are we going to be doing. Um, and so a year ago we had two reporters doing a walk and talk at the debate and now we're kind of doing like a meet at the coffee bar and chat about the election thing. At the conventions we answered people's questions and I tracked down the Libertarian Vice Presidential Candidate Bill Weld and had him do a Q&A and that was solely uh, because our Facebook audience always asks about third party candidates. I think they really want a choice between someone they they're always asking about third party candidates. I think they're like who else is there besides Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump? And so I was like and that's how I opened up the Facebook Live was Facebook, you're always asking me who else is out there? Well, here's one of your options and you know, and I had him give his spiel. So it's fun to kind of be able to listen to people and say like, hey, like, hey, we listen to you and here's someone that we're presenting to you and have that back and forth. And Facebook Live definitely gives that to us. And we get really receptive comments. We don't get a lot of like angry rants or things like that, which is really nice. So that's been fun to play with. Yeah, and um, one thing that we try to do, uh, Facebook Live is a, a really good example of this. Snapchat too is um, we try to learn from these things that we're working on and see what we can apply to other places. So we've done a lot with Facebook Live around the elections because it's been such an important thing um, in people's lives all year. Um, but we've, we've also learned a lot and have tried to take that to other things. So we're, we're doing um, these kind of live uh, chats with representatives all kinds of topics. Uh, last week we had one on uh, passive thing uh, with some editors who worked on a big series. And so what we're doing here, we try to figure out, okay, what are we doing? How is it working? And how can it apply to other stuff uh, that we can work on in the newsroom? Um, one other uh, really good example uh, is is Instagram, um, which uh, is one of my favorite platforms. Um, it's not always uh, somewhere that necessarily lets you easily link back to the stuff that you're doing on your website. Um, but one thing that we set out to do is create something that would look really good in the, the Instagram photography aesthetic. So 
um, at the conventions and then also on some of the primaries. Uh, we had photographers that we were working with in the field um, with reporters, and we set out to make these uh, portraits of um, voters, or in the case of what you're seeing on the screen, delegates who were at the conventions. Um, and they were really they were shot for um, for square so that they would be Instagram native and really close up the kind of thing that we thought uh, would would really like catch people's eye in their feeds um, a little bit like a Humans of New York type thing um, a way for us to really uh, talk to people and try to the human angle that's going on in the election um, in people's feed. We were able to take some of those portraits and build kind of a gallery on j.com um, where it could live, but this was really developed as an Instagram first project. Uh, another thing that we've done is um, you may have heard of uh, an app called Line. It's a uh, Japanese mes messaging app and um, kind of kind of like uh, WhatsApp if you're familiar with that. But we've been online for about two years now, and we were one of the first international media brands to be online. We have um, a little more than 2.7 million followers on there. And um, one thing that we've learned, kind of the conventional wisdom at the time we started using Line, was that this was a way for us to reach uh, an audience in Asia. Uh, we do have an engagement team in Asia, and they primarily run this account um, with help from us in New York. And um, it's really big in places like um, Japan and Indonesia. Uh, so one thing that we've learned over the last year is that there is actually um, both a growing US-based audience online, but there's also an interest um, in the US news, particularly politics and the election, um, in those international audiences. So this is a way for us to push our election content. Um, what you see here is uh, the way um, our notification would look in someone's line newsfeed. Um, and so when we have a debate going on, um, we're going to send a push notification to our app. We're going to put that on uh, our live blog on Facebook. We're going to send a tweet announcing that our live blog has kicked off. Um, and now we have the ability to push that in line at the same time. So we're trying to get that messaging out to a variety of different platforms in a um, distributed but coordinated way. Um, okay, so that's our uh, kind of bit on the different platforms that we've used. And um, let's talk a little bit about social media and how we use it to find sources and um, develop stories. Oh, have I jumped ahead, Natalie? Yes, I have. Thank you. Um, yeah, you're, there we go. You're on a sneak peek. Sneak peek. Um, so this is uh, not an election-specific example per se, but thing that we really like to do uh, is to provide people a way to um, tell us what they're thinking or tell us how they react to a specific story um, in a way that's not necessarily um, the kind of more open form of the comments or not necessarily the, um, you know, the, their, their own social media channels. So we, we've built some sort of a form or a survey. We've used Google Forms a lot for this because it's really uh, easy for us. And this is something that we will come up with uh, with input from um, reporters and editors who are working on a story or on a package of stories and um, figure out, okay, so if we could ask our readers something, uh, what would you be interested in knowing? And we kind of work on some targeted uh, questions where we can get some, um, some more personal type anecdotes or data that we could then use in further reporting. So the example that you can see is um, we did a big story uh, earlier this year about the gender pay gap. And um, we decided, okay, this is something that's going to resonate with a lot of people. A lot of people are going to have a personal story to tell about this. Um, they may want to tell that to us directly, not to everyone in the comments section. And so we set up this form and we asked a bunch of questions 
um, like uh, what's the worst advice that you've ever received? Um, what advice would you give yourself if you could go back five years? Um, and then we set up uh, a way for people to tell us their name, what they do, give us contact info so that we can um, call them or email them and um, talk to them, do some more follow-up reporting. And we got uh, hundreds of responses to this. Um, these are a couple of examples that you can see. Maureen from New York, who's, uh, who works in finance, told us um, in response to the worst advice she'd ever received, just be happy you have a job or stop trying to compete with the men. Um, and this is a really nice way for us to kind of develop um, follow-up stories and then um, kind of our reporters get more sources from it and people, I think people that you know, not only listening to them but actively going to them and saying, what, what else can you tell us about this story? So I love um, one tool we really like. So we Facebook came in and did a training for us is Facebook Signal. Um, if you're a journalist and you have um, Facebook does regular like trainings and webinars. Um, I would just search on Facebook for like the journalist group, and they'll let you know when the next like Signal webinar is. But it I'm going to tell you. Like when I was like, oh, this is a tool, this is a tool worth keeping around, this is a tool worth um, bragging about. So we had a reporters come in and do a training, or we had a training on it in, it was in October of last year. So we're going back to 2015 here. And it, they came in and, you know, it's, it's like a dashboard where you can search for public posts on and look at different things that are trending on Facebook. And one of our healthcare reporters' ears perked up and she was like, huh. And so that was right at the time where we were a year ago or, and where we're here now where open enrollment for the ACA was picking up. And so she started searching looking for people who were complaining about their healthcare coverage. And lo and behold, she found them. She found quite a few. I don't know if that shocks anyone, but people were complaining about their health insurance changing and on Facebook. And so she found them and then she reached out to them and contacted them and she vetted them as journalists do. But she vetted them, she found their stories were true and she used it in a story. And the story was on WHA's front page in November 2015. There's a screenshot of the story. Um, and I think it's a great example of how to use social media to really find um, stories or find a jumping off point and go from there. And um, I don't think social media is like where the story should like the entirety of the story, but it's, it's a good like jumping off point where you can say like, oh, like here's some people, here's how I take the story and find real people to go with it. And that's like how we've used Facebook Signal, which has been great. Yeah. One um, one thing we try not to do is um, use social to kind of look for people who are telling us a specific side of the story. Um, but it's like Natalie said, a way that we can kind of see what's out there and um, try to find people who um, are are interesting, but not necessarily. We don't necessarily go. Uh, the, the story is coming from social media. It's just a component of it, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's like a good listening. And also, she, um, there was all sorts of angles. And it was very easy to find all sorts of angles through listening to, or to seeing it on a dashboard, which I think was helpful too. Um, but yeah, certain, I think it's like one aspect of reporting, which is, which is crucial. Um, so we also have been working on uh, kind of developing bigger enterprise uh, stories and kind of unique different ways to think about politics in the election this year. Um, this is very much a collaboration around the entire newsroom. Um, Natalie, do you want to kick us off and, and kind of take us through some of these? Yeah, for sure. So the things that make these graphics 
And I think the one reason that we're excited about these, I mean, we were before our morning meeting today, we were just talking about one of the graphics that picked up a million paid views over the weekend. Um, these are graphics that have a long tail. They're not built like a news story where they're the they're meant to be seen for weeks at a time. So they're not meant to be seen for a day or two. They're meant to have a whole life. Some of these graphics have lived on for months, and we still can tweet them every single day, and they still get seen every single day. Um, they still can be put on their home page at sporadic times when they're relevant. And they work really, really well on social and they work really well on mobile. And most people that are looking on Facebook and Twitter are looking on a mobile device. So those two things really go hand in hand. Um, but those, those things, the long life, the social, and the mobile are really, I would say, like the WSJ sweet spot like for the election, things that we've really succeeded on. Um, the economic policy and social issues graphics, there's also a foreign policy and Wall Street um, graphic that go along with these that you see in the screenshot on the side. Um, these graphics were built right around, I think they started right during like when the general election started, these graphics launched and during the summer. Uh, they launched at different times, but right about that time. And they were great. They did great then. Um, they just kind of take different social issues like abortion or gay marriage and they show they have different statements by the candidates. And they, um, but we were also able to share them like during the debates when the social issues or the economy would come up or foreign policy, we'd push out a link to that and it would do really well because people would be like, oh, here's a list of everything this candidate believes. Perfect. Um, so and we're, we're able to update these as, as, as they go too. Yeah, so when, I think that's when part people of too. pivot or say new things, um, we're, we're able to allow these to continue to be relevant and, and they're still relevant if you look for them today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they, I mean, they provide like when they update it and stuff. Let's go to look at the next one. Sure thing. Um, so we built this uh, um, Twitter tracker. Um, this is just a, a screenshot of it, but um, we used Twitter data to build this kind of dashboard that tells you all kinds of things about um, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump's Twitter accounts. Um, and the one thing that's been particularly uh, useful to people, I think, is this time since last tweet um, stat that lets you see um, people, I, I've noticed, have found it particularly interesting when a candidate has gone a long time without tweeting. You'll see people start to share this on, mm -hmm. on Twitter and say, oh, look how long it's been since Clinton last tweeted. Um, but it tells you all kinds of things like what their um, most retweeted tweet of all time is. and kind of pulling from Twitter's API, so it just um, it on its own um, at, at certain intervals. And this has been a way to kind of, you know, Twitter has been so central to this election because of how the candidates use it, and particularly how, how Trump uses it as kind of one of his primary communication methods, maybe his primary communication method. And so there's a story in that, and this was a way to not necessarily just write the story of how Twitter uh, is so ingrained in this election, but, but really, really show it in, in a visual way that has resonated with people. Um, this uh, came from the same uh, editor who, who worked on the Twitter tracker, worked on this. Um, this is called Blue Feed, Red Feed. And it uses uh, Facebook data to show um, how, uh, how Facebook feeds of people who lean liberal or conservative would, would um, look based on different kind of um, events that have happened. So um, you can put in, in this case, it's presidential debate, and it'll show you, okay, someone who uh, appears to lean liberal would ha might might be showing these types of Facebook posts, and someone who leans conservative, their newsfeed might be showing these types of Facebook posts. Um, and I, I think this this has been one of the most popular 
stories we've published the entire year, not just politics, but just in general. Um, and I think it, it's been so interesting to people because um, there is such a filter bubble in, in social media on, on both sides um, of party lines. And this has really illuminated that and um, people have found it really fascinating. Um, Natalie, do you want to talk about this one since this one is yours? Yeah, we worked with Facebook. They sent us this data set and um, Brian and Dante, who Dante is like our, um, he can talk endlessly about like congressional districts and zip codes and how those different zip codes vote and different things. It's fascinating. And so we worked with Facebook to get a data set um, that could also explain like how, what Democrats like and, and what Republicans like and what people who like Hillary Clinton like and what people who like Donald Trump like. I think so much of this election has, we've been trying to explain, well, how did we get here, right? Like how did we get to an election where people don't actually like the candidates? Um, how, do, how did we get to an election where, you know, the Republican Party is fragmented and split and, you know, we're just in an interesting place. And so a lot of our graphics and so many stories um, have been explaining how we got here. And this was a fun take on that. And so we looked at Adele, who recently endorsed Hillary Clinton, even though she's British, but that's okay, she did. Um, and one thing I thought was hilarious was the fact that a lot of the people who, um, and this this graphic, if you look it up, um, I think if you just search what you like falls on party lines, Wall Street Journal, you'll get the whole thing. But we ended up with musicians and movies and, um, oh gosh, a whole myriad of different things, singers and athletes and things like that. And what was hilarious is that these, a huge portion of these people had donated to the candidate that like, so much of it really did work out. Um, Adele, for example, just endorsed Hillary Clinton, but Beyonce and Lady Gaga have too. Um, Ted Nugent had supported Donald Trump, um, which was hilarious to me. Um, well, not hilarious, it's the wrong word, but like there was just so many things. It, I just kept finding so many things that that matched up and it was so interesting to me that this really did have some sort of, you know, that there is a that what we like does kind of fall along with, you know, liberals tend to like one thing and conservatives tend to like another, which is interesting to me. We tr we don't want to be typecast, but we kind of are. Um, let's go to the next one. Oh, this one has so you should all go do this. And if you win, you will have bragging rights, which is, you know, that's all we can offer you at the Wall Street Journal. We, we don't do prizes, but we can offer you bragging rights. Um, when we did it in 2012, the person who won was Herman Cain's former spokesperson, which I was <laughs> thought was hilarious. And I, I still follow her on Twitter. Um, but we have a presidential map like pick the electoral college, how, how will it all come down on November 8th or early in the morning on November 9th? And you guess we have over 4,000 entries and like hundreds of thousands of views. So a lot more people are playing the map than, or a lot more people are, are playing with the tool than are actually submitting their map, which is, I think, interesting. People are, people are tweaking how it's going to work, and people are, people are, you know, you can pick the state and you can, you can juggle and, and see how things are going to turn out, but not everyone is submitting their guess and sharing it on Twitter and Facebook, which you know takes a certain, it takes a certain level of confidence to really share your map. But we launched this a few weeks ago. And I think the first day we had a couple thousand entries and it was, I, I was surprised but excited and it's just done well. So it's, it's been interesting to watch. It's, yeah. Oh, I pulled some traffic numbers and this is just politics based, but it's just, I mean, the numbers aren't there, but you can see um, 
where we're getting um, social. And you can see how in March it um, social traffic, which I believe is the um, okay. So the blue line, the light blue line, is the um, Facebook line, and then the red line is the whole social graph. And we have seen different events influence um, social media traffic, but mostly what we've seen is just in the past few months, people are just really following and sharing election-related content. Um, I just saw our monthly report, and this past month was our best month ever on social. Um, and that just, it seems to just be building month to month um, as the election approaches um, and people share stories. And it's, Facebook just told me last week that it's the most talked about topic on Facebook. Um, or that's not true. Facebook said it's one of the most talked about topics on Facebook. But it's just, I think it's dominating all conversation. I'm sure everyone's ready to talk about something else come November 9th. But it's been interesting to watch how it affects how our traffic on politics and especially like Facebook and stuff and definitely how we share our stories. But. Um, with that, uh, I think we're at the question point. Unless, um, Greg, is there anything that you wanted to hear from us about that we missed? No, I think that was great. Um, we can open it up for questions now and I'll, I'll start relaying them and I, I might pepper it in with a few questions of my own. But first, I just wanted to thank you guys again. That was really awesome. And uh, even though we can't hear the audience, I'd like to encourage everybody listening to clap right now at their desk very enthusiastically. Make all your coworkers think that you are crazy. But Todd and Natalie will get the good vibes, I'm sure. Uh, thanks, guys, for doing that. And first question is actually from yeah, thank you. Olmstead Williams. I don't know if he's somehow related to you, Todd, even though Olmstead seems to be his first name at OWCPR. And his question is how many people are on the Wall Street Journal social team? That is a good question. So we um, have tried to move away from things as a social team holistically as an audience team um, in which social media is, is just part of our, um, our toolkit. And so the global audience team um, encompasses um, audience engagement, including social media, um, audience development, um, analytics, and emerging platforms. Um, like uh, our Snapchat Discover channel, which um, if you're in the U.S., you should check out. Um, we didn't talk about it today because we don't do a lot of politics stuff on Discover, um, but uh, it's a, a really, really cool example of how we do off-platform stuff on a, on a mobile device. Um, so I'm trying to think of like a official number, um, but I don't want to leave anyone out. It's around 15 people. Um, we have people in uh, New York, uh, London, Hong Kong. We have Natalie in DC. We have um, some editors kind of around the world who pitch in also, so they're um, unofficially part of our team. It's a little bit fluid, but um, it's a really good global crew that ensures that we're thinking about audience 24-7. Uh, well, and, and you know, just one kind of personal question I had for you guys was like, what, what do you draw the line? Like, what is stuff that the social or now the audience team does that journalists don't do? And then what do journalists do with social media themselves, even the ones that uh, are just kind of beat reporters and not specifically on the social team? Um, do you mean, uh, what do they do that? We we wish they were doing that they're not doing, or or do you mean like <laughs> a, just a differentiation between the roles? Well, actually, I I meant kind of what do they currently do? Like what do the journalists that are just beat journalists 
currently do, but uh, you know, I think you bring up a good point. Like both, what do they currently do, and what do you wish they would do? Natalie, do you want to take that one? <laughs> Thanks, Todd. Um, I can. Can if, I can if first, you want to. Your first question. Um, I write and do social for politics, so. Um, I guess I do both. Um, as for what they current, as for what I wish they don't do, um, <laughs> you know, it's been a it's been a long campaign. I think we've had several. You know, we we try to keep snark to a minimum. I'm not saying any of our journalists have been snarky, but we always try to keep snark to a minimum and um, try to, you know, I always say if, you know, if your tweets couldn't be printed in the Wall Street Journal, don't tweet them. Um, and I, I feel the same way about like, you know, in all social media. And I often say that like, I wouldn't mind my dog, photos of my dog ending up in the Wall Street Journal. So I don't mind posting pictures of my dog on the internet, but I wouldn't post pictures of like anywhere, anything like publicly that I wouldn't want to, you know, be seen. But I'm fine with my dog ending up in the Wall Street Journal. In fact, if we want a full page spread of my dog in the Wall Street Journal, I'm okay with that completely. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, Todd probably sees more of what journalists do than I, I mean, I'm very embedded into the politics team and I the only thing I would say is we often I mean, I sometimes I have reporters say send me a tweet and be like, "Can I please send this?" and I'll be like, "If you're asking, you probably shouldn't do it." And we're like, <laughs> "But I, and I'll be like, "But it is a really funny tweet." And I laughed and then we and we have our moment, but um but most of our journalists, I mean, if you're at the Wall Street Journal, you're, you know what you can and can't say. And so we don't have really too many issues like that. I think the thing that um, makes the whole, um, the whole operation run is having really great stories and really kick-ass reporting. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing that reporters do. And that's the thing that they should be doing. And that allows us to have um, an engaging social presence. Like we can write the, you know, the best Facebook post, um, but it's not going to be successful unless we're consistently publishing really, really great reporting and really great stories. And I, and I think we do a pretty good part of that. So um, I would say, you know, if there there are some reporters who are really active on social and we encourage that um, we you know I think we have some some people who use Twitter really effectively um, we have people doing social stuff in l sort of less public ways like Natalie mentioned the reporter who's using Facebook signal to find sources that's not necessarily a promotional thing but we really want to encourage people to do that um, and tell us about it so that we can support those efforts possible. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, like cranking out awesome reporting and um, and telling amazing stories is the thing that that makes the whole engine go. Yeah, I mean, if you have if you have a breaking news story that I mean, we had a great story about the FBI. The inside. I mean, Devlin Barrett published this great story on Sunday night um, at like five o'clock, and most, you know, things would say don't publish a story on Sunday at five o'clock. Who's reading the news at Sunday at five o'clock? But the story broke the internet. I mean, it did so well, and you know, by all conventions, a story posted at five o'clock is not the ideal time to post a story, but it did. Uh, I mean, it. I think it broke like a million page views in like less than 24 hours. It just did so well, um, and it's. I think the biggest lesson of any sort of takeaway that I've had doing social media is that good news, like a, a good story, 
and good content always wins. And we have really good reporters here. And so that is the like that will always bubble to the top and that will always people will always find that and share that. We got a couple of questions about the Google form that seemed to really intrigue people. I think I can kind of combine these two. Uh, one, and apologies if I'm butchering people's names, uh, Willie Koo at Free Weary, F R E E W I R R Y, asked, how do, how do you guys distribute the Google form? How do you get it out to people? And then I think a good follow up question to that comes from Angela Senna uh, at A N G E A N J E L I C A S E N A. Asking, do you use the Google Forum strictly for re reader reactions, or do you also solicit expert commentary for the sources? So is it kind of from you know, just the everyman on something, or is this the way you try to find experts to quote? And uh, that together with how you distribute the Google Forum. Um, yeah, so uh, in terms of the distribution, um, we try to have it live in, in as many places as possible. So um, this summer, one of our uh, um, designers kind of coded up a way for us to embed it into stories um, that looks a little bit less like a traditional Google form and is styled a little bit more like um, WSJ.com. So if we're running this with um, a story or a package of stories, we'll embed that form right into, into the post, uh, usually, usually at the bottom, but sometimes, sometimes we'll do it in the middle. Um, if it's a series of stories, we'll also, we usually have kind of like a link box with all of the coverage in the series, and one of those links will be a link to the form. Um, we will uh, put that out on Facebook and Twitter and various different social platforms. Um, we may, if we share the on Facebook, the link just to kind of see, oh, there's this form that hear more about me. Um, Google Forms is certainly not the only one that exists. Uh, I know there's a variety of different kind of survey making tools. Um, there's a company called the Coral Project, which um, has a new form builder um, it, that uh, we haven't we haven't tried out yet, but it it looks like a really good solution if you're looking to get started with something like that. Um, so that's kind of how we handle distribution. Um, in terms of uh, what we're looking for, uh, we we don't really have a um, necessarily specific person that we're looking for. So um, it is reader reaction um, as well as a, a place for experts to add their, um, their commentary. I guess if we um, have a story about, um, well, we recently had one about uh, money management, and um, this went with this investing series that we ran out over the last two weeks. And so I guess if people were, were um, you know, on the money management side of things, as opposed to the consumers who are having their money managed, and you know, thing to add there, then we would be interested in it. Um, what we look for is um, people who we can then contact uh, more. So we would never take something that someone says in a form and run it as reporting without talking to that person. So whether you're an expert offering commentary or a reader reacting with a personal anecdote, if we think that it's interesting and worth following up on, then we'll, we'll call that person or email that person. Great. Next question comes from Michelle Garrett at the R is us asking, uh, do you Find or well asking, so you don't find you get angry rants using Facebook Live, any negative feedback on using that platform? And maybe just to make it more broadly, like just what are the things to watch out for when going on Facebook Live? 
you know, I find people mostly stay on topic. We we do get, a, you know, there's going to be bad apples in every bunch, but I've been pleasantly surprised. We had more problems when we would do like a reporter Q&A. And I think this is probably what I'm comparing it to in my head, but when a reporter would sit down and we'd post a picture of a reporter and she would just, or he or she would sit down and answer questions and just type out the questions. I feel like Facebook Live, we get much more um, on topic questions or we get questions or we get statements that are like pretty easy to ignore. Like just people just saying things which are not necessarily angry rants, but they're just being like, Hillary Clinton should win or Hillary Clinton, blah, blah, blah. But they're just statements that are pretty easy to just move on to the next question. We also moderate it for the people on camera. Either we have someone else asking the question or I have um, someone texting the questions to me or to someone watching. But I think other reporters just watch the questions come in and don't mind that. I just find it incredibly distracting to be trying to interview a reporter or a lawmaker and also be watching a Facebook Live of myself on my lap. So like while I'm sitting there. So I have a reporter texting me, like going through and moderating and then texting me the questions um, on an iPad that I've blown up so that the letters are about an inch tall. And that also takes – that also kind of self-moderates the comments. But when I go back and read them, I find that mostly – I mean, if you watch a Facebook Live, you're making a commitment. You're turning on the sound, which is a commitment unto itself. You're putting on headphones or you're somewhere where you can watch something with sound. And then you're writing in a comment about something. So you're, you're making an effort. And if someone asks a question that's like negative, I mean, they're, they're asking a question. We might not be able to answer it because the question is so maybe a little bit off. but. We tr do try to answer a lot of the questions. And even during the convention, someone asked us, like, what's the food like at the convention? And we answered and we talked about it, even though it was kind of random. Like, they asked if there were dipping dots, and we asked, we answered it, that we hadn't seen them. But if we did, we'd let them know. We do also try to have someone um, dedicated to actually responding to stuff in um, in the comments as they come in, uh, it can be a little tricky because they can move pretty fast. But um, if we're if we're talking about uh, packets and stories, and coverage, um, there might be stuff that we can onto using the main uh, WSJ page and give people links to our coverage. That's where those um, those graphics, like where the the economy, in hand, do ask about that stuff. We can provide them with. Uh, value there, um, and then uh, they, you know, if you're if you're reading through, in that, um, there's actually someone there participating from the journal as well. Well, shifting gears a little bit, we have a question from Amanda Jackson at Amanda J underscore T X, uh, who is now a social discovery associate producer at CNN down in Atlanta, according to her Twitter bio, asks, uh, what advice do you have for associate producers trying to advance their careers? Silence. Mm. <laughs> I think, it's a secret. Um, I mean, we're all in this together. Um, I. I'm always trying to answer that question. I think some of the best things that I've found in my career have been reaching out to people that I really admire or that I think are – that have it figured out and talking to them and getting advice from them and um, – or just, you know, some of your best, like, people that can give you advice are your own colleagues or people that are in your same boat who are navigating the same things you're navigating, who are navigating the same, you know, ladder at your own company, or who are navigating the same pay structure, the same things at your own company. Um, I, we didn't start out as a networking group, um, but we have a drinks group at here that's just ladies. And 
I think we started out talking about dating and to to, to rag on the dating scene in DC. Um, if there's any DC people out there, shout out to that. But um, we, um, but we've um, really we call it um, council, and we will often email and we'll be like, oh, let's add the that to the agenda on council. And now we talk we talk probably more about work now than we talk about dating, and we often talk about. Um, like, oh, like, the next time we have council, let's talk about how we do reporting trips and, you know, how we, how we, like, set that up because, you know, you get sent on a reporting trip and in 24 hours you've got to put together a story and that can be overwhelming and, like, hey, like, it's kind of nice to have a group of people where you can admit your fears to people and that's kind of cool. And um, those, those kind of groups that I feel safe with to admit like, hey, this doesn't feel great, or hey, I was nervous here, or hey, how did you like navigate this? Those have been so invaluable to me, both the one I just referenced, but ones that I've had in past jobs or different things like that. And people that I have who are in other jobs who've reached out, um, I think men and women, we all just kind of like have to pick each other up. I met Greg at a bar in Las Vegas. I don't know if he remembers that, but um, oh, I, I think that <laughs> I think that um, we all just kind of, you know, like have to cheer each other on. And I think finding your team of cheerleaders or your personal board of directors or whatever you want to call it is so invaluable and so important because I think career, people often talk about it as a ladder, but sometimes it also feels like jumping off a series of cliffs or, you know, rock climbing or whatever it is. So it can be um, a little nerve wracking, but it's also can be incredibly rewarding to make those leaps and stuff. I would just chime in and say um, it's important to remember, since this is about social media, that um, social media is, is just part of the equation and um, not the be-all, end-all. And I feel like I have known some people um, in my career who spend more time on social than they do um, doing reporting or um, doing the work that they need to get done. And that can um, help you in terms of your Twitter following, but it's not always the best way to get ahead. Um, the other thing is that uh, it's really good to um, spend some time off of social media, especially in this election. It's been really hard to be plugged in all of the time. Um, I often feel like I need to know everything that's going on 100% of the time, and I forget that like it's okay to just not be on Twitter for um, a little while. And I'm sure that Natalie is looking forward to not being on Twitter for a little while after this election is done. Um, so I don't know if that's advice to get ahead, but just um, kind of advice for how to deal with social media. Great. Well, the uh, engagement was really through the roof today. We have many more questions queued up than we can get through, and we're uh, already over our hour, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I will close it out with this last question from Brooks Wallace. at. B Wall 403 from Boston asking uh, Natalie, what's your Insta handle so we can see your pug pics? Exclamation point question mark. It is so, Natalie uh, P. Andrews. All right. So we, we, We've gotten all the all the information we can out of Todd and Natalie for now. Uh, perhaps <laughs> if you guys want, uh, you could answer some of the questions on Twitter that we didn't get to today. But really appreciate your time. I know there is no time crazier for you than these last few days before the elections. So I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone, just saying we really appreciate you taking this hour and uh, sharing all your secrets. For sure. Thanks for everyone having us. Sure thing. Everyone Happy is to. clapping wildly right now, and uh, you, I can feel the vibes from here in Soho. But thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks again, Todd and Natalie, and look forward to seeing everybody for the next one. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Greg. Thank you.